And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, Romans and countrymen, lend me both of your ears because once again, we have a very exciting, thrilling show that I have with us, Mr. Ed Temple, the sidekick that's always getting me in some kind of trouble. And we have Don Ray Brown. And we are going to have Don Ray tell us where he was and where he is today. And we're going to show you some things that will just blow your socks off. Uh, it'll blow your sandals off if you're not wearing socks. Whatever you got on your feet will blow them off anyhow. So sit back and enjoy the ride. <clears throat> For you that are watching on YouTube, you know that little, uh, that little thing that says subscribe down there? Uh, do us a favor and subscribe and hit that little bell. So every time we go live, you will be notified. And we'll be happy, and I hope that you are, too. Let me throw this up here because this young lady said this, Dondre, uh, when she found out that she was going to be on. And she said, okay. Well, uh, I, thought, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so everybody come in, <clears throat> leave your comments, ask your questions. Uh, be a participant, and uh, I know that you will enjoy this as much as we do. So, Dondre, it's a delight to have you, and you're you're up there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, right? Yep, yep, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And of course, Ed, he's in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm over here hugging the water in Delaware. Uh, so. <laughs> So there we are. This modern technology just blows me away sometimes of how we <clears throat> do this nowadays. Dondre, tell us a little bit about yourself and how this how this all happened, where you came from, and, and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, so I'll try to keep that short because it's a very long story. So look out for my book as I talk about that in, in detail. But first and foremost, thank you, George and, and Mr. Temple, for inviting me to the show, uh, because for me, I think it's a good platform to kind of help inspire others, but more importantly, share some of the things that I've learned uh, through my journey as I continue on. So I'll start with uh, being from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I went to Linda McKinley High School. Uh, I literally just finished watching the Brookhaven and uh, Linda McKinley game in 2004 as that's starting to hit all across Facebook, uh, which took me down memory lane. But being from Columbus, Ohio, um, the north side, uh, around my freshman year in high school, I entered the foster care system. Um, for me, it was it was a change of uh, space, a change of reality, and I really didn't know how to deal with it. Um, I come from a, a large family. I have uh, five other siblings. And for us, it it just really changed our dynamics in so many different ways. So living in foster care really put me in a space where I had to rethink and relearn different environments. Um, then at the time, <laughs> love him to death. He taught me so many things. He taught me how to be a man. He taught me how to tie a tie. Um, he taught me so many valuable lessons that um, growing up being absent of a full-time father that I really needed. Um, I was very blessed to to be in that space and, and be around him. But through that, he also taught me how to uh, utilize my gifts and my talents. Uh, for me, I really enjoyed helping others, impacting others. But I was a kind of like a little scared person. Uh, <laughs> I was very introverted, didn't really want to talk to people, really didn't um, want to help larger crowds. I was more of a one on one person. And then I'll never forget um, my principal at the time at Linda McKinley High School, um, Carlton Jenkins. He had entered me into a uh, Martin Luther King speech contest. So for me, I went from talking one on one to talking to thousands of people. Scared me half to death. <laughs> but what the process really did was it allowed me to tap into some of my gifts, which are also my passions, which is to advocate for others. So I never forget the topic. It was um, remember, celebrate, and act. 
and uh, my dad was helping me write. Um, also, Mr. Levy, he was uh, my social studies teacher as well. He was trying to help me prepare this. And I was like, I really don't know what I'm going to write about. I'm nervous. I really don't want to talk in front of people. And my dad was like, just just go to yourself, uh, go to a space and then just write about what you think, what you're thinking about. So I'll never forget the end of the speech. Um, remember where we came from, celebrate where we are, but act and make sure that we act. So that's been my life mission is to act. So from Lyndon McKinley, I graduated and went to Kenyon College. Um, I spent two years at Kenyon College. At first, I wanted to be a cop. Then I wanted to be a police officer, I mean, a lawyer. And then I realized as a lawyer, I didn't want to be a prosecuting attorney or a defense attorney. I didn't know what to do. So what I ended up doing was uh, transferring from Kenyon College after two years. Um, it was a predominantly white school. So um, as a black kid coming from inner city, going to a, a rural white area, I really didn't know how to engage with people. Um, there was also a lot of things that happened to me that I couldn't, I didn't know how to talk about um, or seek services for. So what I did was I transferred to Kent State University, which was a large uh, public institution. So Kenyon College was, um, uh, a quarter of the size, if that, or eighth of the size of Kent State University. So went to Kent State University, a very large institution. And one of the things that I started to major in was political science. And the reason why I decided to major in political science was before I left to go to Kent State, I went to Ghana. I'm in Africa. So I spent a month in Ghana um, helping boys and girls learn history, Spanish, and art. I never forget, it was a life-changing experience for me because I had never been out of the country. So living there, one of the things that it really helped me see is how much they value education. I walked into the classroom and every math problem was done by hand on the chalkboard. So I had to check my privileges as well. More importantly, being there, um, it was like 110 degree weather I was out there every single day teaching the kindergartners, teaching the high schoolers, but also volunteering in the hospital. And one of my professors at the time said, you will make a great teacher. And I looked at him like, no, I'm going to be a teacher. Teach who? But coming back from that 13 hour ride, I realized that I was doing these things um, without mm -hmm. getting paid, without any incentive, because a lot of the things was optional for us. So I went to Kent State University and I told my advisor that I wanted to be a uh, teacher. And my advisor was like, OK, all right, you want to be a teacher? Well, how about you major in political science? Because you were already taking all these law and um, legal courses. So why don't you major in political science and then get your master's in teaching? You don't know what you don't know. So I was like, OK, that's fine. So long story short, I went to um, through the master's program uh, at uh, Kent State University and majored in the Masters of Arts in Teaching, specializing in curriculum instruction. So after earning my bachelor's in political science, I earned my master's in the arts of teaching, and then I started to build curriculum for all these things that was going on in my brain. I was like, how do we help kids with finances? Okay, start to build a curriculum. How do we help kids make better decisions? Start to build a curriculum. Um, so I remember I still have a lot of those curriculums to this day where I would just build them. I wouldn't do anything with them. I would be like, oh, they can do this activity. They can do that. This is how you assess them, things like that. And then um, it was time to talk about my Ph.D. Now, I'm a first generation low income um, student and my family always said you're going to college. Mm. Right. They never really said why. <laughs> right. Beyond it was going to allow you to make more money. But they just said, go to college. It was like playing a video game where you knew there was another level. You didn't know what that level was going to entail, but you knew after you finished high school, you were going to college. And after you got your bachelor's, you get your master's, then your Ph.D. So in route to my Ph.D., um, I started to observe, analyze and critique education. And one of my largest critiques to education was um, there was a miseducation. And the miseducation is where we're telling people to seek and get something, but we're not really talking about what they're not able to receive. So for me, my personal journey led me to be stripped of or sometimes robbed of my culture and identity as I started to pursue another piece of education. And we could talk more about that, but uh, th that's the gist of what my dissertation was going to focus on. 
what shifted to the financial lens was through my throughout my journey in college, I got into a lot of student loan debt. Um, first, it started with credit cards. I never forget it. Express Men. I went into Express Men to buy some socks for twenty five dollars. I walked out with a credit card. Then I went into Best Buy to try to look for a laptop, walked out with a credit card. I went to go get my car fixed. Um, they told me there were so many things that I need to fix in my car, walked out with a credit card. So within the span of uh, two years or so, I ended up accumulating a lot of student loan debt and credit card debt. The student loan debt came with me first having a full ride to school. So I didn't have to pay for anything. But when I transferred to Kent State University, they told me, oh, you can take out loans and you can pay them back when you graduate. For me, I'm like, I'm going to make so much money when I graduate. I'll pay those loans back. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, thinking about my career path, thinking about the interests, all those things never really hit me until around my junior and senior year of college. So what I ended up doing was I started to shift my curriculum um, to focus on finances. How do we help people look at their finances differently? So I uh, graduated my master's at Kent State, decided not to continue my PhD. And we can talk about that, too, if anyone has any questions or want me to go into that. Why? And it led to me working for TRIO programs and TRIO programs serve first generation, low income and students with accommodations. And it's federally mandated that you have to provide financial literacy. So for me, it was a great marriage into what I've been doing for over seven years, which is providing culturally responsive financial literacy that I created myself as well as trademarked and did the research behind um, this system to help individuals manage their money and their finances more effectively. And again, we could talk more about that. So what it led to me was creating my own business. Mm -hmm. I have my own business, which is 1428 Financial Wellness. And then I created a nonprofit, which is Young Money Finances. 1428 Financial Wellness focuses on empowering individuals to take control of their finances. And the reason why it's named 1428 is because it's named after the scripture, Luke 1428, as Jesus was telling his disciples, before you build a building, you must first count the cost. So in that pursuit, I help people not only count the numbers, the monetary cost, but also the behavior. So as as Jesus was telling his disciples, the pursuit of discipleship has a cost. They also had to look at the cost of their behavior. How is it going to shift how they reacted? How is it going to shift how their family reacted to them? The whole landscape of decision making. So what I do is I talk to people about what those decisions entail and how they can help create environments that will hold them accountable um, for financial growth, financial prosperity, and financial sustainability. George, you mind if I drop a question in here? No, go ahead. Okay, so uh, Dondra, here's here's my question for you, and it has, I want to take you all the way back. The man yep. that uh, the man that adopted you, can you talk a little bit about him? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so Dr. Johannes J. Christian, my twin. <laughs> so my dad, um, he was a, a, a he is a, a wonderful man. Uh, he was in a accident where a rock was thrown over an overpass and he was blinded. Mm -hmm. So when I entered the foster care system, I entered a household where he had just went through this accident and was recovering from that accident. So my dad also uh, was a pastor at, uh, at his own church as well as a community leader and advocate for youth all across the country. He actually wrote a book called He's in the House, where he talked about um, his life as a single father taking care of foster kids. Then he also wrote a book titled The Face of Forgiveness as he reflected on um, what it meant for him to go through the accident. Uh, the, the ironic part about the guy who threw the rock over the overpass and smashed his face, he was an atheist. But my dad really showed the power of forgiveness throughout the entire process. And to this day, him and uh, the guy actually have a really great relationship. So I would say for me, honestly, that was a pivotal point in my life coming from Lyndon McKinley, where um, we were a lot of kids were yearning for father figures, male angry. figures. Kind of angry. Mm -hmm. uh, we were yearning for those things. Um, one loss, which was the loss of my family, allowed me to gain a father who was able to really help me see things a lot differently. Like I could be honest and say, 
I don't think my life would have turned out the way that it is turning out without my dad's influence in a lot of my decisions and um, how I wanted to make those decisions. Ed, <clears throat> Dondre being a former student of yours. Uh, Careful now. <laughs> just, just like, uh -oh. just, just like <clears throat> Sheik was a former student of yours. Right. you got to have that warm, fuzzy feeling again, right? Yeah, we always, uh, uh, if you were to, uh, you know how kids always do those, uh, who's most likely to succeed, you know, if you were to, to talk to teachers or students for that matter, and you were to rank, you say, hey, who's most likely to succeed? Or I'm pretty sure that uh, Dondre would have been on the top of just about everybody's list. So there's there was no question about his potential. Although I would say this, you know, he had a, uh, he, he had, uh, he like others, <laughs> I can think of some others. As a matter of fact, you could probably make the case quite a disproportionate number of students are, uh, you know, they're, they're going to school and they're sort of angry at the world in particular, largely because, not exclusively because, but largely because, you know, uh, men or boys when they're growing up and girls, they need a father around. And when your father's not around, you have resentment. I mean, there's no question about it. I, you know, dad, hope you're not listening, but you know, we, we, it's, uh, you know, you miss your dad. You want your dad around. You want to, you know, emulate your dad. You want to know what he was like, what he would have done, what, what his advice would be. And, uh, and a lot of times the dads aren't even acknowledging that they are their dad. So that even makes it worse. And so, uh, so like Dondre said, he could have, you know, he could have grown up and been a perpetually upset and angry at the world and blaming everybody for, you know, whatever mistakes he would have uh, been making. But we knew there was some potential there. Uh, actually, not some, a whole lot of potential. I, I've had literally thousands of students since uh, what I've been, literally been doing teaching since probably, oh, you could, you could start at the clock at 94, officially at 97. And uh, you could you can count on your hands the number of students that you would say, oh, yeah, this guy's going to make it. There's no there's been no question. I mean, he might have had a doubt. Uh, we didn't have any doubt. There's no question about it. So uh, that now we've there's been we you know, there's been occasion maybe once in a while we're wrong about somebody. But this is uh, if I were if this for the stock market, I would have put my money on him a long time ago. As a matter of fact, I'm still waiting on some dividends. So. You know, may, maybe he'll slide us some change, you know, 20 years down the road, maybe five years down the road. But, yeah, that he, he he's always had a lot of potential. And, and like he said, thank God for a godly man. Here's a man that's uh, blinded. He could have given up on himself. He could have been angry at the world. And what he showed, he showed compassion, forgiveness. And so it's kind of like, you know, when Jesus is dying on the cross for everybody's sins, you're, you're thinking to yourself, you know, if you're feeling sorry for yourself, just remember to how humble it was for, for Jesus to get on the cross. Well, in his case, not only is Jesus humble, but his own father, you know, and that's the other thing, too, is, you know, fathers aren't necessarily, you know, you can be a baby daddy. That's one thing. But being a father is not a biological thing. That's, you know, that's taking care of your responsibilities. That's right. So now, Dondre, you can if you ever see his interactions with his daughter, he's in. He's a champion father. He's a great father to his daughter. His daughter's going to, uh, put. As a matter of fact, you want to go ahead and put some money on somebody, go ahead and put your money down on his daughter. She's going to be big time. No question about it. And so just, uh, and that, that's what I said. So he, he uh, you know, his father kind of broke a cycle, helped to break a cycle. And uh, so, and then and Andre just followed through with it. I tell you, I'll tell you what I've noticed. Dondre, since since we met, and I told my wife this this morning. I said that young man is very humble. I appreciate that, and I know our viewers have heard me say it. I don't know how many times the people on the radio over the years have heard me say it thousands of times, but I'll say it one more time. If I can hear a person's heartbeat. That's what I listen for. I listen for a person's heartbeat. I don't look at the glimmer or the glamour or the things around or necessarily uh, what, what they're talking about. I'm listening for their heartbeat. And 
I hear your heartbeat, and I've heard your heartbeat from the very first time that we've spoken. And I told, told my wife this morning, this is a humble young man. He knows where it all started. He knows what he went through. He is ever so grateful uh, to where he is at right now. And he's not one of those that forgets to look back. Sometimes we got to look back to see where we're at today. Uh, sometimes people just don't look back. They just, well, I, I, but I appreciate your humility. I really do. And your honesty. And Andre, I hear your heartbeat. And I'm sure that others, as they watch this, listen to you on the radio, so forth, everywhere that you go, I'm sure they're going to hear your heartbeat too. Here's what I'd like to do real quick, if I can hit the right buttons here, and Espinwab, don't, don't blow this thing up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to take you to Dondre's uh, website, because it is super. And I want to play just, just a few portions, a couple clips that's on there, and you can watch this young man, I call it this young man in action. Uh, it 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 is fabulous so let me hit the right button here bring this up here and hit this absolutely awesome let me get the right button here we'll turn this thing off now morning. that was absolutely awesome and what i want to do is scroll down here to this section here play a little portion of this Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And the average American has about $38,000. Yes, that's right. $38,000 of debt. Uh, mostly consumer debt in their household. For some of you, you may say your student loan debt is so much higher. You may have a mortgage. But on average, um, the household has about that much money um, or that much debt. So, what do we do about this, right? As an individual having debt and not being able to take control of your finances impacts your ability to go on vacation right to save for retirement to invest in the things that you truly value there's so many things that impact your money but i'm here to solve that for you my name is dondre brown i am the founder of 1428 financial wellness with over seven years of experience in really helping people take control of their finances, I thought that I should bring to you an online course that can really help you look at your finances differently. 
So this is the My Money and Me Academy. So through these workshops, my goal is to bring a culturally responsive financial literacy perspective to how you manage your money. So essentially what that means is these workshops are our platforms that look directly at you as an individual that helps you focus on your identity as you think about your money, right? Helps you also focus on your relationships to money. So who's impacting your money and who are you impacting with your money? But then ultimately we set up accountability to help you change the behavior that you have with your money and do what you want to do. So if you are highly interested, motivated, and just want to make a change and take control of your finances, sign up today. See you soon. Wow. I'm going to let this up here because I want to show people the rest of your your website. Andre, you look right comfortable in those environments. <laughs> yeah, so for me, um, one, thank you again for, for recognizing um, the look back piece because I had to, one, um, understand that's where I came from. Those pieces of my identity helped me shape who I am now. Um, even the stories living with my mom and, and watching her as a single parent raise six kids, right? There was so much that I learned there. I learned how to work hard. My mom is probably one of the hardest workers that I've ever met, right? Because she had to not only take care of kids, but she had to come and bring in resources. She had to serve as our teacher sometimes. She had to serve as our father sometimes. She had to serve many different spaces and places where, um, it really helped me look at parenting differently. But then also, like you said, Mr. Temple, I was extremely angry. I do remember um, when I was in the computer lab and <laughs> you and I <laughs> you and I had a, a disagreement and I, I really raged out at that point. I'll never forget that. But then from that, you didn't look at me differently, right? You still had conversations with me. You still helped me. And then to this day, we are where we are. So I'm beyond thankful for that. I'm able to go in those environments because I live in those environments every day. Um, I can talk to parents about what it means to uh, figure out your finances where you have kids to take care of. Not only do I have uh, my daughter, I have six other kids as well. So learning how to take care of kids virtually, traveling, uh, making sure that I'm trying to call them every other day or as frequently as possible, like all those things are um, a part of my identity. I can go into um, a place where there are a lot of foster kids and really talk to them about all the identities that they have to navigate, but understanding that there are different people, places, and resources that they can grab hold to as well. More than just, uh, for me, my dad has really helped me to understand that faith is more than just something that um, you say, it's something that you do, right? So I much rather have faith applied than just to have faith. So my dad really helped me instill that foundation of my relationship with God that had been tested when I was in college. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> tested a lot as I was in college, but coming out and, and really asking God to show me my skills, my gifts and talents led to 1428. So that's my passion. That's my heart. Um, there are times where I drive to Columbus and put on free workshops uh, for the community, there are times in Grand Rapids where I'm working with someone one-on-one. -on -one. Um, people call uh, through my website or contact me through my website. My goal is to really help people um, get over some of the barriers and humps that it took me some time to get over. But more importantly, if I wouldn't have utilized the people, the resources, I don't think I would have been um, in those spaces to overcome those mm -hmm. and continue to overcome as they sometimes come back. So true. You, re you remind me of the old prophet that had a fire inside of him. <laughs> you remind me of someone that has a fire in their belly. Uh, and come what may, no one or no thing is able to extinguish it. Uh, I think that, was, that fire was God-given. It's God-kept. And it's going to be God-continued. Uh, there, there's something there's something uh, let, let me put it to you like this of all the great things that 
the Lord has brought you through and the place that he has you right now. Uh, I'll give you $25 to a donut. <laughs> we ain't seen nothing yet. Now, that's bad English, but that's <laughs> a, we ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, Ed, I believe that with all of my heart while I'm sitting here listening to this young man talk. I understand what you're saying, sort of. I don't really understand the analogy, but I do, <laughs> really. Uh, I totally agree with you. I think that uh, there's going to be, he's got a huge, uh, he's already, his future is great as it is, but his, his future is uh, is just in the beginnings. He's going to have a, a huge future. I think we're going to be, uh, whatever the new format is, I don't know if it's going to be, uh, I think cable TV is kind of going by the wayside, but one way or another, we're going to see a lot more of him. Um, probably going to be on the, on, on, on the outside of skyscrapers, you know, watching video streams of whatever he's doing and, and uh, keep keeping track of him. I, I, there's no doubt that he's going to have a huge influence. That's why we, uh, I'm glad that he's grounded so that he, he uh, doesn't let it, uh, you know, get to his head and, and uh, maybe, you know, become a, you know, a typical, like a politician, not to say he shouldn't become a politician, but, you know, stereotypical person in power that abuses their power and, you know, and takes advantage of it and, and forgets where he came from and forgets, you know, who, what, what his whole uh, motivation was to begin with. God's going to take this young man and use him in such miraculous ways that we, we can't even fathom it in our mind, especially Espinlob, because he only has one half brain cell left. Still got uh, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but we, we can't even, we can't even grasp it. Uh, Dondre, God's got his hand on you, and God's going to take you places, and God's going to use you like even you never thought possible. Okay, I'm done with that. Uh, anyhow, moving, moving right along. You, do you teach at college, too? Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I teach uh, workshops. I'm me. sorry, go ahead. I, it never ceases to amaze me. I should have known better. <laughs> Yeah, so I teach personal finance and I teach workshops for uh, colleges as well. And I love teaching college students because I remember when I went to college, um, I was exposed to grants, scholarships, as well as loans, but first grants and scholarships. And I didn't know that I could do certain things with my grant and scholarships to set me, my family, um, et cetera, up beyond spending it on them. Right. I didn't know that I can start to invest with some of the scholarship funds that I had. I didn't know that I can create an emergency fund with the scholarship refunds I had. I just knew that I could buy an Xbox, a PlayStation, pay someone's rent, uh, take somebody out to eat, uh, buy insert trend there. I just knew I could do those things. So when I'm teaching our college students, I help them to learn and understand that they have resources that they can tap into right now, which I think is awesome. Wow. Ed? Yeah, that's, uh, I think that uh, at the college level, he's definitely uh, going to have a great use for those students. And I, I'm glad that he, he steps down as well and, and helps out uh, the high school level. And to be honest with you, we, let's not stop there. Let's let's go even beyond that. You know, it's just like with um, athletes now, you know, you, you, you know, the quicker you start the training, you know, the, the more uh, ready you are when it comes down to uh, playing a big game. I'll give you an example. Uh, if you look at these um, high state recruits, or even for that matter, the and I put this actually part of my book, is that what you're finding is, you know, the big, big time college football names, which hopefully they have a season this year, but their big names are all very grounded in scripture. They, they have uh, they have huge uh, either fellowship Christian fellowship of Christian athletes or athletes in action. And so it grounds the players. And then if, obviously if they've been grounded before then and not, you know, like for example, when they were in little league playing for some shady leagues and they come into high school and then you got to reteach them everything because they don't have the, the main part of learning is discipline, you know, the discipline and the effort, if you don't have those boy. And then of course, if you have the Christian values, you know, you're not out there, me, 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 you're, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're, you're being honest, you're having good character, you're not getting into trouble, you're not a distraction, you're not, uh, you know, you're not angry at your, uh, your, your uh, or jealous, you know, you're, you're literally living for each other, you know, so there's a whole 
the grounded part of success is as important, or uh, let's just say it's the most important thing. If you don't build a good foundation, it's like the difference between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. You know, one one actually put their you know their buildings on a good foundation. The other one put it on sand. Well, guess what happened when the hurricanes come and the tsunamis come or the whatever kind of environmental chaos comes. Haiti's in trouble because they don't have the foundation. And so, so uh, Dondre has been blessed with a good foundation and seen the dark side of things, seen the light side of things. So it makes him a very well-rounded person. It makes it a lot easier for people to believe and follow him because you know the first question anyone's going to say, hey, you don't know me. You haven't been there. And so he's going to say, well, wait a minute. Maybe I don't sound like I've been there anymore, but I've been there. You know, when Espenlob goes there, they're like, we have to have a translator in English. Like, okay, what language is Espenlob? Is that British English, American English, or Espenlob English? Espenlob, okay. Got to translate that. But Andre is, is, is able to hit, you know, every circuit by his language. And that's important. My, my uh, cousin who passed away, I don't know how many years ago, but now I think Andre might have met him when I, I used to bring him in to do talk about the stock market. And what he said was, he said he never went to college. He self-taught. He took this, the, you know, the Series 7 exam or whatever it is and to become a stockbroker. But he said the issue is when he goes to communicate or when he went to communicate with those uh, on the phone that are educated, he didn't know how to change dialogues. He didn't know how to change his tone, change his terminology. He didn't have that. And so that, that's the beauty of what andre has got. Is he's got he's got all the elements. He's got a well-rounded education. Whether And just like that first college he went to, it might not have been the most fun don't get me wrong however you know the fact is he's going to see more people like that maybe down the road than he will the people like at kent state and so it may or may not but the point is he'll be able to deal with all types and so that's that's a, it's a good experience for you to get it all and i can tell you this uh Dondre, uh mentioned um uh carlton jenkins who is now dr carlton jenkins uh one thing he was part of was was a, a program called Project Grad, and we would stay at college campuses. And here we are, supposedly the worst school in the state, statistically. They, they, we go there, and they, when we leave, we, we used to take kids to New York, and we, we'd also take them, and we would stay a week for the college. And they would always say the same thing. These are the best-behaved kids we've had here. So you take a kid, and you put him in, a, and, and you take him out of their element, and give them a chance to prove themselves, and don't doubt them that they can do it. And guess what? Uh, you know, you, you you give them a chance. And then, and that's and so that Dondre, like he mentioned a second ago, it's not that he just had the opportunities. He took the opportunities. He made the opportunities work. So, you know, there's other people that have had some opportunities, had the ladder put out to them or, you know, uh, been extended some some help opportunities and they and they've refused it. But he's taken upon the opportunity and, and taken the mantle and run with it. Now he's got the torch and uh, he's doing some victory laps. But. Bottom line is, I think that uh, it makes him more credible, and that's why I, I, I feel no. Uh, uh, I feel the urge to make sure that we promote uh, Dondre as much as we can. Talk, tell anybody that'll listen. Dondre, you you said in the beginning where you were uh, in debt. Everywhere you went, you walked in, and you walked out with a credit card. And you know, yeah. two years later, you found yourself <clears throat> head over heels in debt. Uh, and I would assume that a lot of people, perhaps the majority of people that you run into, be it in the classroom or uh, on one-on-one -on -one environment, you run into many, many, many people just like that. What's the first thing that you tell them? Yes. So the, the thing that I love to talk about, so for everyone who um, feel like they can't take control of their finances, one of the, the things that we forget to do or we don't we don't practice enough is creating a budget or a spending plan. So every time someone talks about money or what they want to do with their money, their money, I ask them, do they write it down? And the reason why it's important to write it down from a psychological standpoint, if you don't record information, it drives your subconscious crazy, right? A lot of people like the budget from the brain, but spend from the heart. 
Mm. So people always come to me and say like, oh, yeah, I'm having issues with uh, spending money. I'm in, um, budgeting my money, et cetera. And I ask them to write it down. No, I don't write it down. I have it up here. And at the end of the day, I do X, Y, and Z. But if we think about everything that's in our brains, right, how many decisions we have to make within a day, think about it as a storage unit. Your storage unit is already stuffed and it's not stuffed in an organized fashion. It's going to be really hard to pull something out that storage unit, especially in times of an emergency or when something's due. So when you're able to write it down and record it and then go back to it, that's another way of accountability, but it can also serve as a barrier, right, or boundary. So when I look at um, my family and money, once I started to move in the whole financial frame of really helping my family um, focus on their money, one of my biggest issues was I would give money to everyone. I was a giver. That was one of the big, biggest things impacted my ability to pay down and pay off debt was the fact that I would give it. But once I actually started to write it down, my reason stopped becoming, oh, I don't want to um, feel like someone's upset with me. I would just say it's not in my budget. Now, I tell people with their budget, you show me your budget, I show you what you value, right? So for people that tithe, put it in your budget, right? It makes you a more consistent tither. For people who want to go on vacation, you pay yourself monthly toward that vacation. It really helps you set up a system that other people can't penetrate through your emotion, if that makes sense. Because I remember um, back in the day when I used to get my student loan money, people will call me and say like, hey, they wouldn't even ask to borrow money. They would just say, hey, I have a problem, right? And then I would, in my mind, say, I want to fix it and I want to fix it with money. But now when I want to provide, give, et cetera, I make sure that in my budget, I have space and room for that because we all know we have to take care of our essentials first. I have kids now, right? That really shifts how my budget looks. I have to make sure I have emergency funds available for whatever their emergencies may entail. But I also have to make sure that I pay myself as well for the things that I want to enjoy, whether it's a nice meal or whether it's um, investing, whatever it is, I want to make sure that I put that in my spending plan. So what I tell people is this. First, write down all of your expenses. And then write down your income. If you have more expenses than income, then think about anything that you can cut. If there are things that you can cut, make some of those cuts. I'll call them budget cuts. If you can't, then look at how you can increase your income. If you can't increase your income, then you have to go back and really think about what other resources can you tap into or what other decisions can you make to adjust the way that your budget is currently operating. Of course, that involves a larger conversation of thinking about everything that impacts our money because we only believe that other people impact our money, but it's actually relationships that impact your money, right? There's actually um, politics that can impact your money, right? There are emotions that can impact. There are so many things that impact our money more than just, oh, my mom wants money from me or my friends want money from me. It's who am I as an individual, that foundation that we talked about, uh, what are the relationships that I have to people and things that impact my money? How can I set up a, a form of accountability? And then how can I realistically implement that and show the people around me that I value um, these resources that way? Because money is a resource and a tool that you can utilize. It is not the end all be all, but it's something that can allow you to continue to serve and give in addition to your actual skills and talents. Wow. George, can you put a couple of those comments on it? Oh. Thanks. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, I like that concept, Andre. Jessica said this eliminates people trying to manipulate you. Uh, it's not in my budget. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why I have my shirt, George. Today is called Nope. I'm not buying that. I'm focused on my finances. I had to I had to create this shirt and wear it because sometimes I would go in spaces like Panera, Walmart, etc. And the environment, it just makes you feel like you need to buy something. Especially if you're hungry. Exactly. Right. So I'm like, let me create my own form of marketing to show people around me that, no, I'm not buying that. I'm really focused on my finances. Mm. Wow. Makes some Ned? sense. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, little common sense. Things. I think he's exactly right. You know, as far as writing things down, heck, there's even software out there, you know, that 
uh, that you can get that you, it'll, you know you can lay the budget down it'll take things out you know there's software that'll take you to you know it'll send money to your tithing it'll send money to whatever your bills are but i always tell kids you know if kids come out of a uh, high school and they they think they have to choose a job that makes the most money and my, my my thoughts on that are well first off it's great to make money but you better find something you love to do and worry about worry about not having any debt stop worrying about uh trying to make the most money so in other words get get in the habits of being a poor man and you'll and you'll uh, you won't have to try to uh, be more, you know, have have uh, constantly be in debt. I mean, give me an example. Folks that live in the suburbs, many of them are probably most of them are living check to check. You know, just because you have a nicer house and nicer things and and you have a nice job doesn't mean you haven't made some poor financial choices. There's, there are plenty of doctors that get mixed up in some financial scams and they also have a heck of a lot of debt uh, coming out of college. So. The idea is that, you know, find something that you enjoy. But before you ever do that, you know, like Dondra was saying, you know, when you go to college, first off, try to get a scholarship. And if you don't get a scholarship, you might want to reconsider going to a four-year school right away. Maybe you go to a two-year school, you know. But but the idea of getting a whole bunch of student loans, man, that's just a mess. I, I would avoid that as much as you can. And uh, there are jobs that pay as well or more money. Like I could, uh, obviously, if it was about making money, I could switch jobs right now. Hopefully nobody from my work is listening. But you know, I could quickly switch jobs. I could I could go get a plumbing license, you know, become a master plumber, and you know, make a hundred grand a year. You know, so it's and it's we're talking about uh, something you can do, you know, in less than a year of training, and almost with no, uh, it's very cheap, very inexpensive. And there are some jobs that will pay you to train. You can go to the hospital, you know, and get paid to be with. Now they don't call them uh, nurses' aides anymore. They have some other fancy name, but they train you while you're there to do it. So, and they're making good money. You know, they're making close to forty grand if they even if they don't get overtime, and they're going to easily get overtime. So my point is though that uh, it, this this is his I, the idea. Andre is talking about writing things down. Boy, is that a that's very wise. You know, and not just writing them down. I would even go as far as saying, get your last monthly. Uh, you know, your your itemization. All your stuff is itemized from your bank. You know, you're going to get it either emailed or you're going to get it, uh, you know, they, they might still send some paper trails, I guess. But uh, everything's paperless now. But, you know, and go through there and, and see how much money you're spending. You'll probably be shocked of how much you're spending. Just like right now, the fact that we're not, I still have to work, you know, as a, we're teaching from home. But, you know, the gas money we're saving, you know, and the fast food money we're saving by not having to go drive an hour into town. It's, you know, it's like, whoa, we got a little extra money now. This is good stuff. Because you don't think about it because you just pay it out. Yeah. You know, so anyway, so I, what he, a lot of what uh, Dondre is saying is, uh, is common sense. And I, I uh, bought his, uh, his book on Amazon. What's it called? 1428? Yeah, the Financial Master Planner. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have. I, but matter of fact, there's other kids that I had to go buy it for him. But uh, they're like, hey, can you give me one? Hey, yeah. So I think I got like four or five of them. But bottom line is that's it's a great idea. It's a great concept. I mean, he's, he's exactly right until you, you know, when you go to college, first thing they're going to do is try to get you 15 credit cards, you know, and they're going to make it easy on you. They're going to bribe you. Hey, we'll give you a free uh, backpack or water bottle. And every college kid's like, yes, you had another backpack. APR, same as cash. They, yep. <laughs> Yeah, and then they just get you in debt and debt and debt, you know, and they don't mind because they know your parents are going to have to co-sign, and next thing you know, it's their, the parents' bill instead of their own. And they've also spent a lot of time analyzing behavior um, because my philosophy for my business is also budgeting is 20% um, numbers and 80% behavior. So knowing that from a historical lens, people just struggle with consistency, uh, good decision-making, et cetera. Um, and it's because of many different factors. One of the things I really want to help people learn and do is increase their awareness. People are more likely to make better decisions if they're aware of all their options. So through people writing it down, recording it, making it plain, right, they're able to see, OK, this is some things that I just don't see anymore based on how my day goes. Once we're able to see those, I help you, again, take control 
So if you decide through looking at that, hey, I still want to use credit cards, then that's up to you. My goal is not to um, push you into any other direction beyond continue to give you resources, education so that you can make the best informed decision. Because for me, um, I don't think I looked at it that way, nor was I aware of um, some of those financial pieces until I had to literally sit down and write down all these things and also who was impacting those things. Let's go back up here to, uh, because I, I want to take, take folks to these other places here. Uh, I push the right buttons here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, let, let, let's look at this. This is your staff. Uh, wow. Don Ray has, <clears throat> has surrounded himself with, with folks uh, like-minded that can add to. Uh, tell us about some, some of the folks that surround you, Don Ray. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, first and foremost, if my staff is watching this, I'm very grateful for them. Uh, when I first started the business, uh, 1428 Financial Wellness, there were things that um, I didn't do completely on my own, but it was mainly generated through um, a lot of my work. But then once people started to join the team and partner with me, it allowed um, us to do even more. Uh, so first, I'll start with uh, Veronica Ross. Uh, she's one of our financial coaches. She is amazing. Um, when she, we first met because she was um, attending the workshops that I was doing through financial literacy. And then she actually went through some of the financial coaching. My philosophy for my business is I'm looking for partners, not employees. So I help each or we talk about how each uh, staff person or partner can continuously grow in what they want to do and or their business. So for each person, uh, their goal is to have their own uh, business and own their own um, philosophy approach, et cetera. So for Veronica, she teaches a lot of the financial workshops as well. We partner really well together. We have a balling on a budget workshop where I talk about how to save money from a guy's perspective, right? Very generally. And then she comes in with being bougie on a budget as she talks about some things that our ladies um, and women can do um, that can save them money. Uh, the next person is William Baker. I've known him since high school. He has been like my brother from um, another mother and father, but still uh, we grew up together. We share a lot of passions, have a lot of great conversations about entrepreneurship, um, generational poverty, family, faith, finances. Like he is like my brother. He has his own business, um, Innate Vision, where a lot of the videos that you see on the website, he actually edited those videos, shot those videos and put those together. And hopefully he'll be joining you on your show one day because he has a really great story. Um, and then Jamarissa Watkins, she's my virtual assistant. Uh, she's actually my son's uh, daughter. I meant father, I meant mother, sorry. She's my son's mother. She wanted to, um, I know, right? I'm going through the whole. Uh, she uh, wanted to have her own virtual assistance business. And I told her it would be a great opportunity for us to partner. So she handles a lot of the administrative work um, for what I do in the business. And then we have uh, Justin. Justin is phenomenal. Uh, we have three interns at the bottom. And Justin, um, I was teaching a personal finance class at Aquinas College. Stellar student. He did really well in every aspect. So we sat down and talked a little bit about um, some of the things he wanted to do, and he wants to get into accounting, be a CPA, et cetera. So he wanted to partner together for an uh, internship, but one of his gifts is talking to college students because he's still a college student. He has a very conservative spending nature, which is phenomenal, but he's very realistic with his approach as well. So I really um, appreciate that, that lens for our business. And then we have Justin and Jacob. Um, they are basically two peas in a pod. <laughs> they assist with the marketing. So they assist William with the videography and the photography, but also they want to learn more about finances as well. So every single member that you see on this current team has gone through some 1428 financial wellness education. And we talk about investing. We talk about saving. 
uh, we have those conversations during some of our staff meetings because we want to carry that forward. Because for me, it's not enough to just make sure that uh, my kids are OK financially. I'm trying to do something that expands, that has a generational impact. So I believe uh, great teachers are able to live forever as they live through people and some of the things that they teach and some of their philosophies. So that's what I'm able to do with my team, but beyond grateful for their skill sets because they've been able to literally transform my business and speak into my business and feed and give into my business in ways that there's no way I could have done that on my own. And Dondre, I, I think that uh, maybe you ought to, I, and I don't know the organization name anymore, but uh, Josh Galligan, I don't remember Mr. Galligan from uh, Lynn McKinley, uh, he he uh, teaches at a vocational school now in Delaware, but uh, he he was connected with a Christian organization that would help uh, people uh, get out of debt, it's like a it's like a debt organization where they they uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, they have people write their finances down, but then they also talk to the the creditors and and renegotiate and and so I think something like that, you know, if you guys maybe joined up with them, boy, you would. It would open up a whole other door, other doors, and it also would kind of goes. It makes a seamless uh, transition to what you're already doing, and I think it, it's a it's a good fit for you. Uh, but it's Josh Galligan. He's probably one of your Facebook friends. Good okay. Man, and he, he was he was part of it. I don't know that he still does it, but um, it's very very useful. And I would guarantee there's a a huge demand for it. It's, yeah, huge okay. demand. Thank you. Let me find this, what I'm looking for. Uh, let's see. I was there before. Uh, come on, Espen Lob. <laughs> get, get that one half brain cell fired up here. Uh, hey, man, did you say, oh, it's still one half? Still one half? Still one half. She, so you still got that half left. That's good. I've had that half for a long, long time. It's holding up well. It's holding up well. There, there was a place on here. Uh, help me out, Dondre, where yep. where you had uh, 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 like an hour of coaching and and this. And oh yeah, if you click on offerings, just click on it. Okay. Okay. And then details. Details. Well, I'm sure glad you're here. You know how to operate your site. Uh. <laughs> so those are, yep, those are the workshops. Are you talking about the one-on-one -on -one coaching? Yeah. Uh, there was there was a thing where it was like, uh, this is free, this was free, and then this was. Oh, like okay, yeah. So yeah, go back to offerings. Sorry about that. Click on offerings, and then you'll see one-on-one -on -one coaching to the left, and you just click on details there. Okay. Click on offerings. Right. Yep, and then the details, yeah. I got you. I got you. Mm -hmm. And then scroll and then click at the bottom. For right there. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was looking for. Didn't seem like, there it is. It didn't seem like I had that hard a time when I, of course, I was doing it all by There's myself. the other schedule button next to home where you can just click on schedule. Okay. As well. I wanted, wanted people to see this uh, because my, oh, my, there's, there's so much that, that, that you offer, but can you go over some of this here? And, and mm -hmm. let me put this up here before I forget. Uh, just as reminding, you're offering a discount for financial literary courses for the month of April. Uh, uh, yep, 60% off. <laughs> I thought I'd better throw that up. Uh, <laughs> Leave it to Tatiana. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Somebody's on the ball, huh? <laughs> she should join my marketing and sales team. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, so some of these things, financial co uh, counseling, 25 minutes, and so on and so forth. What what do these all entail, if you could go there? Yeah, so the one-on-one the -on -one financial coaching, uh, free 15 minutes is, I tell people that, Sometimes we don't do enough with taking advantage of free, right? So, and on top of that, talking about money can be a little intimidating for a lot of people. 
Uh, so the 15 minutes is essentially an opportunity for us just to have a conversation for 15 minutes and me to assess some of your needs. It could be as quick as, hey, I have a question about a car loan, et cetera. Again, my goal isn't to tell you what to do with your money, right? But help you utilize different resources to make the best informed decision. Some of the calls that I usually get is, should I get a credit card? I always ask people, why do you want a credit card? What do you need it for? Do you know the interest rate? Do you have stable enough income? You know, when you have a credit card, um, they look at your character, right? There are C's, the, the five C's, the um, having uh, your credit score, which is linked to the, the amount of debt that you want. So really breaking down some of that education within 15 minutes, but then having them decide where they want to take that conversation. I say, based on what you want to do, do you have financial goals? No, I don't have financial goals. Well, I highly recommend that we kind of sit down and craft some of those goals for you. Because if you don't know what you're aiming for, you'll either miss or make it every time, right? Depending on your perspective. So how about we we shift some of your energy and motivation because the people that call are motivated, right? They want to do something or get some information. How about we shift that to some action as well and help you um, attain what you want to attain? The uh, next one is the My Money and Me Academy. So if you take the classes, as Tatiana was saying, this April is Financial Literacy Month. So the classes are 60% off. If you take those classes, you get free coaching uh, through me. So it's a great deal based on the, the price of coaching. And then for our students, I try to provide uh, discounts for our students, but also help them understand the investment into education. Um, I'm currently coaching two college students right now. Uh, they're, they're planning to get married soon. We went from our first conversation, them not even knowing what their budgets looked like. They didn't know what each person was making. They don't even talk about money to now them finding. And when I say finding, uh, talking about what me and Mr. Temple was saying, becoming more aware of how much money they're spending, $1,500 extra a month. Mm. $1,500 extra a month, right? Because their money were going in so many different places. They didn't plan for it, they didn't talk about it. And they didn't have what I recommend is budget meetings monthly to really talk about how they were gonna spend their money. So for them, they invest $30 a month to get about 15,000, I mean, $1,500, that's a great investment. So that's one of the uh, things that I offer for our college students. For our individual financial coaching session, what I do is once people sign up, they'll receive what I call is a discovery form. So in the discovery form is a list of a few questions. It's not a headache, it's about two minutes for me to learn a little bit about you. What are some of your financial successes? What are some of your financial failures? What are some of the things you want to do with your money? Do you know how much debt you have? Have you seen your credit score? So a really quick evaluation slash assessment that will help us get to the next level of really trying to help you take control of your finances. Within that hour, I highly recommend that people have some type of way to plan their money. Though I have my planners um, on Amazon, I'm not pushing my planners on people. As long as you have some way that you want to budget, I know I've helped individuals where they've used the planner for about a few months and they're like, I'm going to go electronic. For me, that's fine. Allow, as long as it allows you to do what you want to do with your money. The couple's financial coaching session, um, I kind of make it mandatory for my business where I will not coach um, one person if there is a spouse or someone else that is impacting your money in your household. Uh, for me, that's chasing a rabbit. So if you are in your household and you're learning all this information, and the other person isn't there to receive it in that environment, you typically chase your tail. And people usually call me saying like, oh, this person doesn't understand. I am not a marriage counselor <laughs> and my goal is not to counsel, but my goal is to highlight and emphasize the importance of uh, finances on relationship, but also what that can also enhance such as communication, right? So instead of always paraphrasing it, how about you join the coaching session and we can all talk about it together. And then I provide things specifically for couples that can help them have meaningful budget meetings with one another with uh, what I call the, the budget meeting checklist. And then finally, I encourage people to do the bundle. I'm a firm believer of plan it, plan it ahead. So whether it's once a month for the next five months, you buy the bundle, each month we'll schedule a time where we'll focus on your finances. So that's something that you don't have to worry about. Those are just some of the um, offerings I provide. And then, again, I offer a couples bundle as well so couples can plan ahead. So if you want to plan for a wedding, 
right? And you really want to get your finances together for a wedding, we can talk about how you can avoid loans, right? Make loans your last resort, make debt your last resort as you plan for your wedding. So let's plan out the next few months, how we're going to help make that look as well as when uh, people are trying to get married and do other things. How can I prep them to have conversations? I know people are afraid to call debt collectors. We talk about and we also go through uh, mock conversations. I play the debt collector. You uh, be the individual. And I help prepare you for those conversations as well as provide you with scripts so that you can talk to debt collectors as well. So, again, my goal is to continuously help you, educate you and empower you to take control of your finances, because I'm actually uh, being in a position where you won't need my services because you've assumed all that education so that you can then teach your family and then teach your generation, because my goal is to be the last generation that starts from scratch. Wow. Whew. <laughs> I know it's a lot. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm telling you, this this has been uh, th this has been so much fun, so much fun, ladies and gentlemen. Please go to Dondre's website. There, there's so much, so much there. You can watch those videos. Uh, I just, I just enjoy those those videos. Uh, it's, it's my guy in action. He, he's uh, he's doing what he does best, uh, mm -hmm. and, and he makes so much sense. And there's so many things on there. So please go there. Uh, I've got his I've got his Instagram thingy up there, uh, and then then there you go bounce off of his website onto Facebook and on Twitter. So you you can bounce all over the place and get yourself a good education. All your contact stuff is up there too, right, Dondre? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you you can get a hold of him. Oh, wow. This this has been a tremendous tremendous journey. I have enjoyed this so so much because my, it is needed. And now, now with all this crazy stuff that's going on, but perhaps for the first time in a lot of our lives we have almost come to a screeching halt where it's time to sit down and reflect and think and plan. Uh, so this, this would be a great time to go to that website, get a hold of Dondre and, and uh, if nothing else, talk to him because he knows, he knows what he's talking about. I'm telling you, he knows what he is talking about. Dondre in closing, I'm going to say this. I've been sitting here the whole show and, and I've been listening intently to what you've been saying. And in my mind, I keep going back to your dad. Oh, God bless that man. Ladies and gentlemen, there is one case that shows each and every one of us that one person, one individual can make all the difference in the world. Look what that man has done. By the grace of God, that he'll give God all the glory and all the honor. But look what that one man has done. The life and the lives that he's influenced. And now Don Ray is carrying the torch. Uh, my. Lift his dad up in prayer. Lift Andre up in prayer. Just lift each other up in prayer. And we're going to come out of this thing on the other side. The birds will be singing. The sun will be shining. And we'll climb that mountaintop one more time. Guaranteed. Ed, your final thoughts, buddy. Well, I don't know what the heck you're talking about on that last uh, analogy again. But uh, I'd agree with your sentiments that... Uh, <laughs> And I, I think Andre might have used a rabbit analogy, too. I think he either got it from the Kenyan College or from you, but I don't know which one. Some, some, sometimes I rub off on people, you know, you know, like I rub off on you, Ed. <laughs> my goodness, oh, boy. Ah, my, oh, my. And each and every one of us, we can touch each other's life. I started to laugh when I said that because... <clears throat> Man, stay away from Espen Lobb. He'll, he, he, 
He's like a train wreck. But anyhow, <laughs> Don Ray, mm -hmm. we're going to hear a lot more from you. We're going to hear a lot more about you. Uh, let's stay in touch. And we'll bring Don Ray's podcast onto our network. And we'll put him up there on the program slots. And uh, you'll be hearing more from him. And, of course, my sidekick, Ed Temple. You'll continually hear more more from him. Uh, it's it, It's been a blessing, gentlemen. It has been a blessing indeed. Mm -hmm. And ladies and gentlemen, start those watch parties. Get them out there. Uh, share this with everybody near, far, and wide. This is something that needs to go out there uh, in cyberspace and just bounce off of everything and everybody. So until then, Dondre, thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you, too, Ed. I appreciate it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, Romans, and countrymen, whether you're down the street, around the corner, across America, or somewhere around this great big world, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Push this thing out there. Be kind one to another. Love one another. And don't ever be afraid to say, I love you. It could possibly save a life. Until tomorrow at high noon, we'll see you later. Bye, everybody.